one of the math coaches here in Farmington. I taught kindergarten for eight years, second grade for six years, so now I'm in this role. And I'm really excited to share with you that we have a brand new math program this year in Farmington. It's called Everyday Math. Has anybody heard of Everyday Math? A couple people? Yeah. Oh, you have? All right. Um, something that's really exciting about Everyday Math is it involves real-life problem solving. So you're going to get, um, through Everyday Math, a uh, curriculum that spirals. So those concepts aren't taught in one unit and then kids test it, and then they move on to maybe another unit. So traditional math has been where we teach maybe geometry, and then the kids learn geometry, and then they test, and they move on. And then maybe they go into OK, can you hear me better now? Thank you for telling me. Um, it's a spiral curriculum. So the kids are going to get m the concepts multiple times throughout the school year. They're going to start out a little more basic and then build on, build on those concepts um, throughout the school year. So for uh, Michigan, we have these strands in mathematics, counting and cardinality, which is basically a long way of saying counting and number sequencing. Operations and algebraic thinking, kind of your addition and subtraction. Numbers and operations in base 10, which is place value, measurement and data, and geometry. And yes, we do do this in kindergarten. <laughs> and down at the bottom, if you're curious about these standards, um, you can't really see it, but if you go to commoncore.org, you can find the standards for math. It's covered. It's okay. And I just talked about a little bit about the spiraling, so we can go through this one. We can skip this one. Go ahead. So when your child comes to kindergarten and they're getting ready for mathematics, um, every day there's kindergarten daily routines where they will be looking at um, just your calendar. And they'll be doing things like uh, graphing during calendar, tallying the days. Um, so here's just kind of a sample of what it might look like in the classroom. They do temperature routines and weather routines just to build in some of that mathematics in a, in a way that they can understand. Yep. Uh, the next piece that we, it's brand new for everyday math, they're called quick look cards. And quick look cards are used from kindergarten to third grade. And what they do is help kids recognize a quantity, quantity um, as a number. So three representing three dots or three items. Um, as kids move on to first grade, that's where they're going to start to count on with addition and subtraction. So if you have three plus two, they're going to hold the three and count up two. This is what's helping them hold that three to create that visual quantity that they'll eventually be able to count on with. There's also a student journal that the kids will be working in. Um, it's not as in-depth as they'll be getting into in first and second grade on up, but there is a little journal for them to start practicing um, writing their thinking down. And they'll be having the se second half of the school year. My favorite part of everyday math are the games. And this is where students really build their fluency with numbers. Um, the games range from um, counting to addition to subtraction to probability. They also do geometry, and it's just a fun, hands on way for kids to learn math. In everyday math, there's already differentiation built in, so it meets a range of student abilities. So, if, um, every teacher has options to these card with these cards every single day for a lesson. There's a readiness piece an enrichment piece for kids who are beyond that concept, and then just extra practice if they need a little more support. At the beginning of every unit, you will receive a parent letter that comes home telling you what the next unit is all about. And it has um, background information, vocabulary, games, and more for every single unit that comes home. And there are home link trimesters, three little home link books. Some teachers send them home all at once or at the end of the trimester or the beginning. But if you see these, these are just fun ways to practice math at home. 
Another great component of everyday math is the online piece. And we are lucky in Farmington to have a lot of one-to-one -one student uh, to technology ratio. So they have Chromebooks that they can use. And our program has an online piece that you can access at home. And the kids will get really good at doing it here at school also. Um, but the middle piece at the bottom, one, two, three, four, are the games online. So the things that they practice at school, they can also practice at home. This is a website here, Everyday Math. If you just typed in University of Chicago, that is the university that supports Everyday Math. There is a plethora of information from this website. You can get everything you can imagine on home support for parents for mathematics. Um, let's see, there's study link problems, vocabulary, definitions, tutorials, and then just the basic concepts for mathematics. So this is part of why you're here today. <laughs> Building number sense. Building number sense, exactly. Building number sense is just the opportunity to learn and experience numbers. As kids, they're naturally excited about math and about learning. And we really encourage you um, as a parent at home to talk about numbers and to count with them and just what do they notice about the world around them. And this piece that's highlighted right here, um, all of these experiences with numbers build what we call fluency. Fluency in numbers is where kids are just very naturally can connect the concepts between numbers and ideas with numbers. Um, let's see. So the kindergarten, first and second grade understanding of fluency and number sense is the foundation for the rest of their mathematics. And when you say, like, oh, it's just kindergarten, first grade, really, it is the base foundation. Kids have to learn this number sense piece to really make connections later in life. So how can you help your child at home? One of the biggest things when, when your kids are starting to learn about numbers, even letters, is to start with a visual. They really need to see what they're doing. Okay, so start small with numbers ranging from zero to five, and make sure they're visual. So it could be objects or fun things they like to count or to play with. Um, once they've mastered that five, then move on to 10. Sometimes we try to rush our kids and go a little too fast, you know, or work to 10 or even the teen numbers. Well, they don't even, if you're working with 12, do they understand what a 12 is? They might have memorized it or sequenced it, but do they really truly understand? So if we build the understanding of what a five is and how we see five in different ways, that's number sense. That is building fluency. So one way you can practice at home, uh, practice counting and grouping objects. So one of the fun ways we do snack at my house in the summertime, I have a kindergartner, he's five, and when he was little, like preschool age, we would count out our snacks. You know, I'd give him goldfish, and he would count them out, and we'd practice them together, and we might only go to five, and he'd eat them, and then I'd give him the rest of them. You know, so we'd have to count the whole bag. And then maybe we'd count, as he was eating his goldfish, we'd count backwards, because a lot of times as parents, we forget the backwards counting, and we see kids struggle in that kindergarten and first grade because they're having trouble with subtraction. So we don't count backwards a lot every day. So I would encourage the forwards and the backwards counting. Um, talking about relationships among quantities. So this is a fun one I was telling you about. Do they really truly really understand what a number is? Um, my son loves Legos. So we have a number puzzle at home. And we can put the puzzles in, we count, but then it's connecting them to a quantity. So if he's putting a one, two, three in, we might take the Legos and build what does a two piece look like, a five piece look like. So they're making that connection between them. And then, oh, can you go back one more time? I'm sorry. And I love the part that we're doing it together, but asking that, them questions like, which one has more, the five or the three? Which one has less? You know, looking at equality and different size objects. Maybe the big Lego pieces versus the little Lego pieces, but they're both three. A lot of times kids will say the biggest Lego pieces, even though there's three, is the largest amount, bigger than the small. We're talking about quantity. Okay. 
So we're going to try a little something now. Um, I know some of you have been at work. You look really tired. <laughs> I've been at work all day. I get it. Um, this is something that's critical, and a lot of kindergarten teachers do this, and I'll tell you why it's so important. It's practicing numbers with your fingers. Okay, so we might ask kids in the classroom to show me two. And they show two. As they can do it visually, sometimes they'll go one, two, two. That's the very beginning piece of counting. They count one at a time. Eventually, you want them to be able to show me two, they raise the two. They know immediately it's a two. Then after we go from there, zero to five, we're starting out small. Then we say, okay, show me two above your head. And they have to make it without looking and seeing the number in quantity two. So it's becoming a like a mental image they can immediately do. And then as they're doing two, show me two another way. One and a one. Can I do it on both hands, making two a different way? You can do that with all the numbers up to five. Visual first, then hidden. And it helps build that number sense. And I just want to tell you, <laughs> one of the reasons why that this is so critical for children is once they get to addition and subtraction, the very beginning piece of counting is when kids count out by count three times. So if they're doing two plus three, they'll do one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. They count three times. It's because they don't understand this quantity piece yet. Those quick look cards I showed you, that this is a two, so they have to count them out. Eventually, when that fluency starts to come in, they're like, oh, it's just two. I know what a two is. One, two means two. They'll start going two, three, popping them up right away, and then one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> sorry. And then once they get that piece in first grade, they'll start counting on three, four, five. So it's a sequence of progressions that sometimes we don't realize as parents that you have to start out really small and move up. So some ways you can help your child at home, um, just read and tell stories, sing songs with numbers. So there's songs like, um, there's Tang in the Bed, and the little one said, roll over, roll over, they all rolled over, and one fell out. Now going from 10 to 9. There's another backwards counting piece. You can find these on YouTube. Type in YouTube, but in counting songs, they'll pop up. I'm a horrible singer, so <laughs> I'm not going to sing the rest for you. But you can do that. There's books um, available. Even some of these are online books. Um, Chicka Chicka Boom Boom with Numbers. Um, some dinosaur books. You can go to the library and find books on numbers. And then just ask your kids those questions, like, how many, how many dinosaurs do you see here? Or um, what else are you doing? How many, uh, what do you notice? How many are there? Okay. Uh, some games to play at home. In your packet, if you picked them up, I gave you a game that we play in everyday math. It's uh, matching with dot cards. So you have a, if you didn't pick them up, they're out there. Go ahead and grab them. And I'll explain a little bit more about this later. But again, those dot cards are helping kids to, we call a big fancy word called subitize. It's a seeing a quantity as a number. Okay, so they're showing two, two diagonals, two dots up and down, two dots sideways. They see too many different ways. So just plain match. And then games with numbers, counting, and dice. So again, lately I've noticed kids coming to school not playing board games and not recognizing the patterns on, on the die. They don't know it yet. And the real great thing is that here in Everyday Math, they're going to play lots of games that have dice involved. So they're going to be getting that naturally. But if you can play board games at home with them, with the dice, you're just going to give them um, a kind of a head start. Not even to mention the personal skills you get from playing games and the winning and the loss piece, you know. So the next piece after you play match with them, with those dot cards. You can do something kind of like the traditional game of war, where you flip it over, and the one with the more dots, or the bigger quantity wins. And they collect them, and the people, person who has the most cards at the end wins that round. So just another way to play with those cards I gave you. 
So within the math handouts, um, I put down all those pieces that I touched on about ways you can help your child at home with mathematics. And then on the back side, I showed you the top it with the dot cards. And then if you're like, oh, my, my kid knows those quantities pretty well. We've been doing this for a while. You can also play with just a standard deck, one to nine. Um, and then you can flip them over, and they might show a nine and a seven. Which one's bigger? Nine, you win the cards. Just a different way to play. Um, that was kind of fast, but that is... My name is Carol McGorisk. I'm a kindergarten teacher at um, Longacre, and I have been teaching in Farmington for 30 years. So I've been here a long time. I even went to school here. I'm from Farmington, so it's real neat to be able to work here. During that time, I've been kindergarten. I've been first grade. I did some literacy intervention. So I'm thrilled to see you guys here today because many years ago, we talked about how important it is that parents are here with their kids. You guys need to know what the expectations are because without you, we cannot do it. We are a team and we have to work together. So seeing all of you guys here today is like, wow. You don't even have kids in kindergarten yet and you're here. So I commend you. I think you are amazing that you're here and taking the time to do this because it's so important that you understand where your kids need to be when they finish kindergarten. And so coming here and taking the time to really learn about it is phenomenal. So you can pat yourself on the back if you want because I think that's pretty awesome. All right, I'm going to talk about literacy today. And literacy, you can go ahead and give a switch. Thanks, Karen. Literacy is really reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Today, I'm going to focus in on reading and speaking and listening because my dear friend Anna is going to do writing right after um, I'm done. So those are our four components. And I need to tell you, I'm going to start a little bit with listening and speaking because, granted, I have children in there significantly older and way taller than me now, but when I had them at home, I know one of the most important things that was hard to do is to kind of keep them focused, and I had three boys, and to keep them turned on. So back then there was Game Boy. Yay! Game Boy, like, saved my life. The video machine that I could put in the car, yay! You know what I mean? I can kind of plug them in because I was a busy parent. You guys are busy parents, and I see busy parents in the grocery store all the time, and somebody's holding on to a tablet or some little somebody's holding onto a phone. And I get that, but there are so many opportunities for learning wherever you take your child, and your child is always excited about it. So if you go to the next slide, I have this very silly little video I want to show you about a mom in the grocery store. And maybe she's kind of silly, but I want you to listen to what she's saying and how she's working to build her child's vocabulary. So if you click that, so that the link didn't stick. So anyways, what she's doing is she's walking in the grocery store, right? She's walking in the grocery store, and the, um, gosh, the sprinkler system turns on for the lettuce, and she says, oh, it's going to rain. Oh, my gosh, I need a hat. So she puts something over her to say, oh, now I have a hat. Or she walks by the bananas, and she goes, bananas, bananas, bananas. What does bananas start with? It starts with a B. Let's count the bananas. Basically, she's silly and goofy, but she's talking to her child. She's talking and she's listening, and the child is responding back. Think of two families going on a trip. One family is driving down the road, and they see some cows. And the mom says, oh, look, there's some cows. And the baby looks at her, the child looks at her, great. The next family says, oh, my gosh, those are cows. How many legs do they have? What color are they? What sound do they make? Think of all the rich vocabulary you guys can bring to your kids. So the next time you're in the grocery store and you do what I probably did with the Game Boy and you hand off that technology, stop and take the time and talk because that is so essential. Listening and speaking is so essential. So that's my little soapbox. Sorry. <laughs> can we go to the next one? All right. The person doing the talking is the person doing the learning. Just think about that for a second. I'm a teacher, and I am always talking, right? 
But I have to remember that it's not my show, it's their show. So stepping back and listening to them and let them be the ones doing the talking, explaining what they're learning. That's phenomenal. When I, she was talking about mathematics and I was thinking, wow, in my classroom, if we see those dot cards, I say, how do you see that number? And the kids have to explain how they saw it. They have to say, well, I saw two dots there and one dot there. Building their language, building their vocabulary. So remember that the person doing the talking is the person doing the learning, and that's your little one. Go ahead, you can click one more. Okay, so I'm going to zoom into my reading a little bit here. Why read for 20 minutes at home? This chart just shows you that student A is reading 20 minutes every night at home with moms and dads. Now, your guys are little, and their attention span is short. I get that. But the amount of time that you can spend with them just sitting there reading with them um, will help to build their vocabulary. Student A will have read um, the equivalent of 60 school days, student B only for 12 school days, and student C only for three. If you want to be a better reader, you have to read. And you guys right now are, are the key to showing them how to read, right? Because you're modeling what it sounds like, what it looks like when they are readers. When your children walk into our classrooms here in Farmington Hills on the very first day of school, or Farmington, we're going to give them a book, just any old book, and we're going to skip past it right to them and say, can you show me the back cover? Oh, she's good. Can you show me the front cover? Where do I start to read? Watch her open up the book, playing into those words. These are book concepts. They're called concepts of print. And that very first day when they come in, I'm going to ask them that stuff. You know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to open that book and I'm going to say, guess what? I'm going to read, but you're going to point to the words. And I'm going to see if your child, this is going to be trippy, right? Can touch, can touch <laughs> under the words. That's one-to-one -one correspondence. Tracking that print is essential for your child to be a reader. I don't expect them to know this right away, but gee, if you were reading with them over the summer, could you do that with them? Could you show me the title of the book? Could you show me the author? <gasps> can you tell me that funny dot at the end of a sentence? Work on all those things with your child because that grows them as readers. So I just wanted to let you know that that is what we do that very first day. Wow, it's huge, isn't it? And a lot of them are like, oh, I'm not sure. But by the end of the school year, they've got it. And again, that's with you guys helping, not just what we do in the classroom, but what you guys do at home. All right, thanks. You can give me a click. You know, I'm good, but I can't remember what the next slide is, so I... Okay. Oh, look. Look at me. I jumped right ahead. So read to them until they leave you. But Dr. Mary Bigler, who was a very famous literacy um, instructor in Michigan, as you read, point out book conventions. Those are pretty much all the stuff I just told you about. That front of the book, the back of the book, where does the print start? And pointing under each word as you go. For children to be able to even know that when you're reading, you slide to the next line, is an essential component, too, of reading. So all of those things are things you want to build when you're sitting reading with your child at home. Go ahead. Um, does it matter what they read? No. There is print everywhere. The very first couple days of school, I flash a sign at Target. I flash McDonald's, and we're all going, Target, McDonald's. They know those words, right? They know that vocabulary. So you want to build that. Reading can be anything. Easy books are great. And I'm going to tell you one funny story. So, your children are going to begin to read picture books. They're called picture books because the pictures help to tell you what the words are saying. It's like that on purpose. And I've had some parents hide the pictures so the kids are just reading the words. Don't do that. <laughs> the pictures are there to help your child, right? So I know you want them to key into the words, but the pictures are also there to help your child figure out what the words are. So always make sure that they, they are using those picture clues because that's one really essential way that you can figure out what's going on. Can you, should you do books that you reread again and again and again? Absolutely. Even if you say, oh, my child memorized that. Way to go! That's awesome. Yes, they memorized it. But as they're doing that, they're understanding story structure. They're learning the conventions of print. They're beginning to be able to tell a story with a beginning, a middle, an ending. They know about problems, and they know about how they were solved. 
Yes. In the very beginning weeks of kindergarten, we read the same books again and again and again. And what happens is during reading time, when your child's holding a book, I walk by and they're telling corduroy out loud. They're retelling the story. Hooray. Go ahead, use those favorites, and, but use them as a teachable moment. If you're thinking they're not really knowing what the words are, say, hey, find a word in there that starts with an M. See if they can touch the letter M. See if they can find the letter T. Can you find a capital letter? Maybe a lowercase letter. So use those books as a way to teach them other things. Read harder books to really build vocabulary and comprehension. When, we are, when you are reading a book and a word is one they don't know, stop and talk about it. Ask them, do you know what that means? What do you think that means? Make sure that you're building that vocabulary because vocabulary helps to grow them as readers too. All right, so the reader has a giant job to do. We don't think about it because we're so used to it, right? It comes so naturally to us. We just look, we're reading right away. But these little guys are going to learn to decode words, and some of them are known words, some of them are unknown. They're trying to sound right. Fluency is to sound, sound like you're talking when you're reading. So when, well, if we are reading like this, then we are not using fluency, right? So when kids are beginning readers, they kind of read like that because they're still learning how to get those words out, right? So when you have your child reread and reread a book, the book starts to sound like they are talking, and that's what fluency is, right? Can you imagine if I read a story or you read a story to your child and you talked like a robot? Unless the story's about a robot, they might think that's kind of cool. But if you sounded like that, then oh my goodness, how boring. I wouldn't want to hear it. Right? And neither, neither would your child. So we want to grow them as readers. And fluency is, is a big deal that we begin to um, help kids do that. Using strategies for comprehending. Why are we reading? Not to sound out the words. We're reading to get the author's message, right? So comprehension is key. You want to think within the text. That's a retell. Thinking beyond the text and thinking a little bit about the text. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a second. So when we click it, <laughs> okay. so what is the reader doing? It's a lot, so we teach them to be strategic. Students learn strategies to process text, so go ahead. Now, of course, we make strategies fun, right? So we, these are different ways that we can make it kind of fun for you. Stretchy snake tells you to stretch out that word and use all the sounds you know. Uh, Skippy Frog says skip the tricky word. And then read past it and go back and get it. I remember when my own son was learning to read, and I was teaching him this, because I'm like, once you skip it and you keep going, you're going to catch that word. It's such a great strategy, because meaning is always in your brain. You're always trying to make sense, right? So that one is helpful. Eagle eyes, just look at those pictures. Chunky monkey says to look for chunks in words, like at in a word, so mat, sat. Splatter, all of those have at in it. Flippy Dolphin says, and this is probably the hardest strategy for kindergartners, but they just, he just asks you to flip the vowel. So if it's not the long sound A, then it's the short sound A. And then lips the fish, get your lips ready to read. Try and Lion says, try to reread. And then Careful Caterpillar said, says, does the word you're reading, does it look right, sound right, and make sense? I did not make a copy of this for you guys today, but if you go online and search up um, these strategies, you will find them because they are on there. But that's what we use in kindergarten to help them. So lots of strategies. When kids are stuck on a word, I say, oh, go use a strategy. And they always look up and find one. Pretty soon they start doing it themselves. You can click it. So I told you about talking about the reading, right? Because they, they need to comprehend. So this is a questioning tree. Now, I just showed this to you because it's really a great visual, because I'm a visual learner too, for how I question kids when I'm reading with them. So if you've read a story with your child, right? If you've read, let's say, Jack and the Beanstalk, if you've done that. If you've read that with them, after, you can ask some questions from the questioning tree. The questioning tree, if you look outside, if we walked outside, we have all these beautiful green trees, right, that have just come out because now we've got spring. We can only see the leaves in the trunk, right? We can't see the roots, but we know they're there, right? And we can't see the dirt that's down there, but we know that's there, too. An on-the-surface question is one like a who, a what, a why. Who's the main character in Jack and the Beanstalk? Jack. Why did Jack go up the beanstalk? To 
you know, find gold and meet the giant, whatever, right? And those are easy kind of questions, who, what, where, when. Those are kind of simple. But kids do need to be able to just talk about that. Those are within the, within the text kind of questions. But then the roots are under there. Those are under the surface, like why questions or how. Maybe, maybe it could be, should Jack have stolen the golden goose? Right? I mean, you're asking your, your child to really analyze, how did this character act? Those are deeper questions, a little bit deeper. And then the last one, we call it within beyond about the text. The last kind of questions that are way down in the dirt there are the ones that are life experiences. Have you ever had a time when you wanted to take something that wasn't yours, like Jack took the golden goose? Right? So relating that to your life. When I read with your child and I assess them on their reading, I'm going to ask them questions like this. Tell me some of the important things from the story. Those are kind of the easy ones, right? But then I might say, have you ever had an experience like this, like the main character did? They have to think about it. And it's really funny, because it's hard for them to do it. So ask them. Relate it to their life. Text to self-connections really help them to understand. And I know you know, because you've read books that, that connect to you, right? And you're like, oh, I totally got so much out of this. Well, we need to get children to be able to do that, too, even with those simple books that we read with them. So thinking about the tree maybe will help you to make questions when you're reading with your child and asking them to comprehend. Go ahead. Here's more talking about the story. Retelling hand. This is just, you know what? I always tell your kids, you always have, a, you always have your hand with you, so you can always retell a story. Basically, you read a story, you put your hand up, and I just had surgery on these hands. So. <laughs> uh, anyways, you put your hand up and you talk about what happened in the beginning, in the middle, and then at the end. So these are just other ways that you can retell um, a story so that you can help your child to understand it because we're going to be asking them those questions when we assess them on the reading. Go ahead. All right, here's the, the two bookmarks that I did give you tonight. We were on the table. Just a story we tell. So you can use your hand. You can use the bookmark, whatever works. Always just thinking about that you want to retell. When, when you close that book, you're not done, right? Because you want to talk about it. You really want to know what they know about the story. So here's one on the left for just a, a fiction. And then here's one for nonfiction. Because nonfiction books are really important to read, too. Right? And you need to be able to retell them. And it's just a little bit different because you want to tell some of those facts um, or details from those nonfiction books. So you can keep these to kind of help you over the summer as you're reading with your child. Okay, expanding vocabulary. So you want to identify tricky vocabulary. And one of the ways you do that is by talking about the story. Because you can find out how much they know by um, when they're retelling. Because they can really build that vocabulary. Um, this is kind of a word in investigation. And um, I used this a lot um, when I was a reading interventionist and well, with a lot of my students that had more than one language. Because it really helped them to build that vocabulary. So you just put the word on the far left side. Then you draw yourself a picture to remember what it is, and then you write the meaning, and then you think of a connection again. Remember how I talked about text to self-connections? You want to make those same connections with vocabulary words, too. So that's a, a really essential to build those for vocabulary. And no, I don't know what text. It's not here. Okay. Oh. But I guess we're going to wait on these till after. Okay? Thanks. And now my dear friend, Anna. Hi, I'm Anna Kaufman. I work with Carol at Longacre Teaching Kindergarten. I've also been teaching for 30 years. It goes by so fast. <laughs> um, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Um, I've been kindergarten at Longacre for 10 years. I'm going to talk a little bit just about writing, and then I'm going to show you some examples from current children um, to show you an example of September, November, February, and currently where we've been writing. Um, a lot of it goes along with what Carol did say. Um, you may think, writing in kindergarten, do they just come in and start writing? No, they don't. The whole first month of September is really oral language. Talking about stories, about real things that have happened to the children. She even teach my children, the first thing we talk about is being what it's like to be a listener, what it's like to be a speaker. And then I have them actually practice sitting knee to knee, eye to eye, when the child, one child's talking about something that they did, the other's listening, and then they take turns. So it's really getting them to talk about their experiences. Before they start writing, though, 
the one thing that parents can do is really build upon their oral language by providing opportunities, tons of opportunities. For instance, like the video with the mom in the store. How about, oh, you just went to the beach with your children on the way home. Maybe have them retell it. What did we do first? Then what did we do? How did it end? Or have them tell you. What did tell me about tell me about today? And let them recreate it in their in their mind and tell them. In kindergarten, like Carol said, we use a hand as a graphic organizer. It's to help them organize the story in their own head. Right, so if they went to the beach, they could say, Today we went to the beach. That would be like this is like one page. We decided to build the same castle. Next page, third page. All of a sudden, a wave came and washed it away. <laughs> the fourth one. We ran away from the wave because it was cold. Fifth one. We ended up deciding to build another sandcastle or whatever. So they are literally, that's what we do in the beginning of kindergarten. We take, we have them think about their experiences, organize it using their hands, and in kindergarten, in the beginning, we might just use three. What happened first? What happened next? What happened third? Beginning, middle, and end. As we get them thinking in the beginning, in the beginning of sept uh, September, we want them to be able to come in writing their names and being able to draw pictures about what they're trying to tell us. And I will show you in a couple minutes what that looks like. We don't expect them to be writing, but we do expect them to be able to write their name. And I would stress upper and lower case, because if you think about it, we read in lower case. So children should be exposed to both. As the year progresses, by November, October, November, they start, as we're teaching them about the sounds and the letter correspondence, they begin to stretch out their sounds. So they're beginning to write, they're drawing their story, and they're beginning to label. So they might be drawing a tree. They were out at recess. They were talking about what they did outside. There might be a tea by the tree, okay? Or they might say, I like dogs, okay? They're not going to be able to write all of those, but they could say, I like might be LK, dogs might be DG, or just D in the beginning. So really, we, we take them, as they're learning the sounds, and the, the letters, the sounds the letters make, beginning to decode, beginning to put them together. It takes a while, and we know that. Um, but the more you do at home by talking about their day, tell me about what happened. What happened first? What happened next? What did you do outside today during recess? And literally have them have, uh, practice these oral stories with you. By the time they go to kindergarten, we will be, eventually, they'll be putting those stories down on paper and then be able to stretch out what they hear, be able to write down the letters of the sounds. But it's all a process. And the best thing we can do, like I said, like Carol said too, oral storytelling, getting them to retell what they hear. Another big component that we've noticed in our little ones that come in, the fine motor experience is huge. Getting those those fingers ready. They do a lot of writing. They're not only drawing in kindergarten, we're practicing letters right away, um, math, and writing numbers. If I can give you some examples of things you could do this summer, um, picking up small items with tweezers. Um, sounds kind of funny, but getting those little, those little muscles going. Um, building with marshmallows and toothpicks. Play-Doh activities. A great Play-Doh activity would be rolling it out so it's like a snake and taking a child's scissor and cutting it. Scissors, please, parents, have them practice the scissors. <laughs> Huge. And they sell the, they're not going to hurt themselves, the kind that we have in school, are rounded and they're for children because they come in sometimes without having any scissor experience and have to use scissors all the time. And it is, it's awkward for them. It is hard. So cutting that, that, that Play-Doh, um, rolling out Play-Doh, anything to do with putty or clay or Play-Doh. 
cut along a straight line with a scissor. Draw a line for them, see if they can cut it. Then once they get to do that, make it curvy. Mm -hmm. You can do a lot of zigzag, all of those to get the little hands going. Moving rice from one bowl to another with tweezers. <laughs> Hole punching colorful paper. Stringing beads. Exposure to different writing tools like crayons, pencils, chalk, markers. Okay. Um, all right, taking the uh, front one thing we do in kindergarten is rainbow writing. So the colors of the rainbow. Have your child write their name and then red. Write it over in red. Orange, write it over in orange. Yellow, green, blue, purple, the colors of the rainbow. We do a lot of that with our sight words that we teach them. And just that, not only are they practicing their name, but they are getting that exposure, that hand, using that crayon, using that pencil, pressing down. Um, another thing is writing the name, or I said that using capital A in your case. Get them in the habit of having the first letter in their name be the only capital letter that they write with. Um, do you want to put on the examples? I want to show you from some of our, my children in one of Carol's this year. I blocked out their name for their privacy. What something in September looks like. Okay, it's okay. You'll be amazed. <laughs> um, where we are now, it's funny, I've been doing this for so long, but still, still I'm surprised at how far we come. Another thing, real quick, is pencil grip. We've noticed that once children learn a certain pencil grip, kind of it's a, it's a habit that gets learned. Um, so instead of if your child is grabbing the pencil like this and writing, try to, it even sometimes helps if you put like a cotton ball in your palm and to write it so it's resting, okay? We want to get away from this because let me tell you, if they do that for a couple of years, like if they're doing it in preschool and they come to us, it is hard to, I mean, we work on it constantly. But even having, like I said, something in their palm, it helps to grab that pencil. And we use the little um, handwriting with, without tears pencils, which makes it easier to control. When you have those long pencils, it's kind of hard, or they'll hold it too far back so they don't have, the, you know, they don't have enough control over the tip. Off two pencils exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. They're about this size. It's perfect for the little fingers. They have more control that way. <laughs> okay. So that one's September. Okay. <laughs> this is pretty much what. Um, September looks like. Let me grab, actually, I have the writing that goes along with it. I think it got cut off. So I will read to you what. Okay, no? Okay. She dictated it to me. Okay. And this little girl, this is the beginning of the year. My grandma, my grandpa, and cousin Mama were at Frankenmuth. We played on the playground. Of course, she's not going to be writing that at this time, you know. But she did put the N for Momo. And she put, I believe, the J. Um, you know, I don't even remember what the J was for, but the G was for Grandpa. So that's what a kindergarten paper looks like in September. Rarely do they come in writing words. Some do, but a lot of labeling. And that was the first, I believe, the first couple of days of school. We have them come in and we give them a prompt, like, you know, tell me about something you know all about or something you did over the summer. I can't remember what the prompt was. And all the children did their best to draw. Again, taking the story, drawing it in pictures. Pictures help them to remember what the story is in their head. So we always have them write sketch first, okay? Let us not ask, asking for perfection, a lot of using um, shapes, circles for heads, triangles for the body, or rectangles to help them with that. Okay. The next one's going to be November. That's okay. 
<laughs> Technology, right? Okay. All right. Can you just move it up? Just oh, that's February. <laughs> November. Okay. Oh, November's upside down. Oh my goodness. Okay. We did think we were going to have a dark camera. We did. And if you can just move it up. Okay. And he said on the far left, I was getting ice cream. Okay. So I, W's was, G is getting an ice cream. I think it's supposed to be an I. You probably just don't see the line. The next one, it was, was is W, S. Or, it was vanilla and chocolate. <laughs> he told me and chocolate. He didn't write the and chocolate. But look at that vanilla. VNL. He's getting that middle sound. I mean, that is November. Think about it in the beginning, two months before this, writing nothing. So they begin to put those sounds together. It's just, I mean, yeah, it is, it's so exciting. I've been doing this for so long, it's still so exciting <laughs> to see the change. I think the next one we have is February. <laughs> and these are the same children. We grew up to different ones. This is a girl. Oh boy, let me just, okay, so this one was, I was sleeping for a long time. One thing we do teach is spacing. Developmentally, that takes a while. I'm still telling, reminding the children right now. Use spaces, at least you have them put their finger down in between the words. But I was sleeping. She got the ING, which is amazing, for so long. My mom had to wake me up. That's with no help. That is February. And we get the BNDs confused, and that's development in the UK. We keep reminding the more they write it, really, the more they write it, the more they'll get it. You know? And finally, <laughs> this is just one page from May. <laughs> and we're doing an information. Um, it's actually called personal exp expertise. And the children are writing about nonfiction. They're writing about things they know that are real. And this was about fish. Fish hid from this actually the fish yeah, hid from the shark. So as the children progress, they write smaller, there's now spaces, there's punctuation, and notice the only capital is at the beginning of the sentence. So that is where we are right now. Let's see what time is oh, perfect. Um we're gonna go on to social emotional and then we will end with some qu so questions. Um, we want to make sure that they get in here. Good evening. Thank you for your patience. First of all, we would never have children sit for this length of time, nor would we adults, because attention span um, from the brain research we found is 10 minutes. We're past that. So I'm going to have you stand up, please. And we do brain gym um, in the class. Conscious discipline has four in particular that we do. We're going to do two right now. The first one is, uh, I'll talk you demonstrate. How's that? Opposite. OK. Well, the first one is the pretzel. My favorite. It really works. They put one foot. Oh, you're going to do it one foot over the other. There we go. Thank you. Go ahead. OK. Technically, your tongue should be on the roof of your mouth, and then you are breathing as deeply as you can because we know the need for oxygen. And we do it usually five times. I'm going to have you do that five times. Breathe in as deeply as you can, holding that position. And then exhale. Yeah. And again, inhale. And exhale. And again, inhale. And exhale. I'm going to five. Again, inhale. And exhale. Last time, inhale. And exhale. That's called the pretzel. Another one that we like to do is the balloon. You take, you do the balloon. Put your hand. We might do it differently. We put our hands.
hands on the roof of our head, and you breathe in as deeply as you can, and you're going up, and you're popping pop or letting the air out. And again, five times in, and again, yours might be better. And I like that. That's good. Okay, and again, and and last time in. And of course, we have brain buttons. You might rub your earlobes. Uh, you might write, rub your collarbones. And these are things that we teach them, one, because we need to get their attention back for whatever we're talking about. Two, they become self-soothers, and we'll get into that in a few minutes. So, oh, we are ready. Okay. Do you think you can answer? Okay. And I'm sorry, you may sit right here down. Okay. So as parents, we want our children to do well in school and in life. And experts say that to achieve this, you need to, of course, help them to learn things before school begins. You've heard about math. You've heard about reading. You've heard about writing. But now we want to look at your social emotional side. Kindergarten used to be half day, and it was mostly social. Now, whether you consider it fortunate or unfortunate, it's a full day, and it's highly academic which means that we haven't put quite as much time into their social side. And it's something we are finding through research we really need to do. OK, so, so yeah. social and emotional health is a young child's growing ability to form close relationships, express and manage emotions. We call this self-regulation. Explore new environments, take on challenges, and stick with tasks, and be able to problem solve. So relationships. So this means that you know children enjoy interacting with others, that they trust others to protect him or her. They seek and respond to attention from others, that they can make and keep friends, and that they can show kindness to others. And that's empathy. That's a big one in kindergarten and even with preschool. Okay, we'll talk about emotions and self-regulations. First of all, emotions, we want them to show many emotions. It isn't really normal for someone to be happy all the time, someone to be angry all the time, someone to be um, sad all the time. Now, it wouldn't be a normal range of emotions. We want kids to show those. We want them to talk and use the iMessages. I don't like it when you do that because it, they are standing up for themselves but it also allows the people around them, the other children, a, a chance to react appropriately. Um, we also expect socially with emotions and regulation that you would your child would turn to you if they were afraid um, or if they were unsure of something. That would be completely normal. We also want um, your, your child to be able to calm down when upset without harming themselves or harming others. And, and you may see more of that. You've probably seen a lot more of that when they were two and three. Um, but you still might be seeing that. We want to get beyond that. And uh, finally, we want to see them work through conflicts with others. That is not going to happen right away. These are goals for, it'd be nice if they came in that way. They won't, not all of them by any means. But certainly goals by the end of the year that they get better and better at it. Again, this is not to suggest that if your child does, isn't doing all of these, that that's not right. Our job is to help them to learn how to go about this. Alrighty, exploring new environments. So actively exploring uh, people, places, things around them, taking on challenges, things that may be unfamiliar, um, and being able to stick with a task, showing perseverance. Problem solving. Once again, I'm going over some things, but we're not expecting that they come prepared to do this. These are things that we're hoping they'll get, and some children do come with these skills. But if not, it's our jobs to teach them, to help them get through this. So listening to gentle reminders. Um, they may not want to stop playing. We prepare them. Um, in five minutes, we're going to stop playing. In two more minutes, when you hear my voice, uh, or when I clap, when I'm done clapping, you're going to stop playing. Gentle reminders, getting them ready. Transitions can be 
are very hard. Um, accept changes in routine. This is another tough one. Um, again, you might not want to stop playing. You might not want to go on to, um, I don't know, maybe we're going to music class or something. But transitions are something that happen in life, and we need to get better and better at going through these uh, changes in our routines. Um, trying new things. We want to try to get kids away from learned helplessness. Many kids come in and, and they'll say, when my mom puts my coat on, great, let me show you how we do it now. They feel pride. They become more independent. It doesn't mean you're any less of a parent if you're needing that, needing them to need you. But really to help them, you want them to get beyond that helplessness. They can do it. Now, they might do it wrong 25 times. Um, so what? Give them a chance, try it again. That's awesome how you did that. Could I help you a little bit? I think many times as caregivers, we do so much for them that we can teach them and they really can start to do it for themselves. And actually, when it comes to kindergarten, uh, the first month of going through the lunch line, generally speaking, they can't open their milk, the straw. I, managing all of that, that's something they haven't had to do, but they're going to learn to do it. Um, show curiosity about things and people. Ask many questions. I know it gets exhausting. We want them to ask questions. The more they ask, the more they're thinking. It just shows how intelligent they are. But we want that. And we would love to see them eager to try anything. Anything that we're going to do. Oh, yeah, let's try that. Okay, so what can we as parents do to support our children's social and emotional health? Oh, thank you. Okay, you want to do this one too? Yeah. Okay, so working through problems together. All right, so how can we help our children? So school age children are just learning to solve problems independently. They're learning to think independently. They're learning to make decisions. Things that we can do to play an active role in this. What your child could have done instead. So if they make a poor choice, that's okay. It's a learning experience. So we can talk to them and say, we really shouldn't have thrown that toy. What could we have done instead? And helping them work, we could have just put it away nicely. What can be done differently next time? Same thing. Let's not throw next time. We might, we might um, break something. Let's put it away nicely. And how can your child, um, how can they help another person feel better? That's another big thing, too, in preschool and in kindergarten. We're talking about empathy and how my actions can affect somebody else. So talking through this with your child is important. One thing I do in my class is oftentimes somebody will hurt someone. And immediately, I didn't do it. And then you're working through, well, what happened? You hear, try to hear both sides of the story. And the most important thing is to say, not you're sorry. I mean, that's great. It doesn't really mean much. And they'll say, I'm sorry. So they definitely don't mean it. But what I teach my kids to do, ask them, are you OK? Is there something I can do to help you? Because probably 75% of the incidences in the class are accidental. Somebody tripped over someone. They bumped another person. They bumped another person. It doesn't really matter. Are they OK? Can, what can we do to help you? And many of the kids are, um, I could use a hug. A hug will do it. It's amazing. Or a band-aid, of course. So teaching them that it isn't just worrying about saying you're sorry or who's to blame, but rather, is that person OK? How can we help them? That goes with that empathy. OK, what can we as parents do? to support our children's social and emotional health. So easy things that we can do. Gently hold and cuddle your child often. You cannot hold and cuddle them enough. I've got two. I've got a five-year-old who is in kindergarten this year and then a two-year-old at home, always loving and kissing on them. Um, respond to your child's efforts to communicate with you. And it can. There are times where I'm like, I just need silence. Give me two minutes of silence. But it's important. It grows their, um, even going back to like the reading and the math, it just grows their experience. Making eye contact with your child, sharing smiles and conversations, stories and books. For us, I know in our household, dinner time is the best time for us to do this. We're all sitting and eating together, and we ask the, my five-year-old, how's your day? Who did you play with? What special did you have today? 
and having them talk with you. And then he now knows my five-year-old will ask us, Danny, how was your day at work? And so this is the way, you know, that we talk in our household. Um, joining him and her in one-on-one -on -one play. So whatever they're wanting to play with at home, whether it's Legos or blocks or superheroes or Barbie dolls, play with them. That's very important. Uh, gently guiding your child through social situations. So let's say you're out at the park and your little one wants to go over to another little one. Help them. You can say, why don't you go ask her if she wants to play with you? Just guiding them along with that. Um, be sure your expectations match what your child is socially and emotionally ready to do. Again, I know that that can be hard, even just speaking from experience. By the end of the day, I'm tired and it's bedtime and we need to get this rolling. And sometimes I will ask my five-year-old to do something. And I'm like, you know what? I have to take a step back and go, he can't do that on his own. I can't ask him to do that. So making sure that what we're expecting for them to do, they, they really can't do. Important tips for parents uh, for, um, with children for all ages. Celebrate your child's strengths. So things like when uh, Ms. Manville was saying, if they're trying to put their coat on and they haven't quite got it, but tell them, I love that you tried. Let me help you now. Or whether they're putting their shoes on. And even if they can't quite get it, encourage them. Um, if they're washing their hands, I love the way that you got that soap and scrubbed your hands so well. You got your hands so clean. Just encourage, lots of encouragement and not about their sweats. Um, when your child acts up, try to uncover the real reason for their behavior. Three, four, five-year-olds, sometimes they can't tell you why they're upset. They can't tell you the actual reason that they chucked that toy across the room. So bringing them over and saying, how are you feeling? And talking them through it. Also, do not let your child witness family violence. Do not let anyone physically abuse or hurt your child, even with words. That's very important. Taking care of your own social emotional health. This is important, and I know for me, too, this is the hardest part. When you're so busy at work all day and with your kids, it's hard to take care of yourself because you're taking care of everybody else. Um, but it is very important to take care of yourself because if you are good and you are healthy, you will be able to then take care of your children, your family. Okay. All right, so discipline and social and emotional health. Um, positive discipline involves guiding a child uh, through uh, to good behavior. So the biggest thing is you yourself as a parent have to be calm. If you are upset and you go into a situation enraged, it's not going to help anybody. So calm yourself first. If that means you need to take a few deep breaths or you need to walk out of a room for a couple minutes and then come back inside, you do what you need to do. Set firm, clear limits gently enforce those limits and teach the positive behavior. So um, oh, follow through consistently. So if you did it one time, you've got to do it all the other times too so your children know mom really means I can't throw this toy across the room. Um, and I put there redirect and give a choice. So if a child does something, like one of the examples I have here is if they throw a toy, you can tell them you may not throw a toy in a house. It's not safe and you could break something. Let's play something else. We can play with the Legos or we can play with the blocks. So you're still giving them the power of making the choice, but you're still choosing. So that, that is also very helpful. Um, and, and the kids like it. The kids like that they get to choose. Oh, I get a choice. I'm going to play with the blocks. It avoids power struggles. So if you are concerned about your child's social or emotional health, here are a few resources. Um, there's Project Find, and there's the uh, website and phone number, and then there's the Great Start Initiative. And of course, you can always talk to your child's pediatrician as well. They are a very good resource. A few resources that we find to be very helpful. So in all of our classrooms, we have something called a safe spot. Maybe uh, your uh, teacher will call it like a cozy corner, but it's either a, a corner of our classroom. We've either got like a beanbag chair, cushions, uh, stuffed animals, blankies, stress balls. Um, I know I have stress balls in my room. And if you go on Amazon and you search stress relief toys, you will find a plethora 
of options. Um, there's a how are you feeling today um, emoji chart. I really like this one because it's very simple. It's um, just like an emoji, um, and it's got, I think, six different feelings on there. So sad, embarrassed, surprised, scared, mad. Um, and that way your child can maybe, even if they can't tell you, I'm angry. They can point. This is how I feel. Uh, and then there's calm down strategies. So in the, uh, the resource page that was out there, if you pick that up, I have all of these listed on there. I have the Amazon um, the links that you can go to get, to get these. And for the calm down strategies, I have the, um, the teacher's website that you can go and print these out. I have these in my classroom, and I actually have a set at home as well. Um, a safe spot is something that you can do at home, too. I've, I've got one in my house. And the calm down strategies are things like, uh, what can you do if you're upset? So one of the cards shows um, a child getting a drink of water or counting to 10, um, doing like push-ups, like wild push-ups. So there's different strategies that kids can use to help calm themselves down. And these are also board games that involve problem solving, and that is another thing I know I think Andrea Edwards had mentioned that we're seeing that kids are not playing as many board games. So these are games that you can play with your child at home. The one th I have a lot of these games at home. The one thing I really like about them, there's no winners and there's no losers. You work together to solve the problem. Um, that's a big one, too, with three, four, five, even six-year-olds. They don't want to lose. So if you've played a game and you've won and they've lost, I know my five will be like, that's it. I don't want to play this game ever again. Um, so hoot owl hoot. Can your so I know for hoot owl hoot, you have little owls. And the one goal of the game is to get all the owls into the nest before the sun rises. So you work together to do that. Um, stack up. I've got feed the woozle. These are just you work together. Stack up is a silly game, so you pick up um, cards that say silly things like, you know, like hop on one foot or, you know, it's singing or this and that or like 